Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I do keep apologising, but I am neither a medic nor a historian. I have a face for radio. I should never be on television. And, and you have been so kind in asking me so many times would I do this, and I have felt so uncomfortable and such a fish out of water, but Ian and Gail just wouldn't let me go. So if it's really bad, I am so sorry it's their fault. I didn't want to be here, they asked me. Isn't it sad, though, that when you get, you know you're getting old when you've got more letters after your name than you've actually got in it. And, and there comes a point where a lot of them seem to come free with a pint of milk. Not all of them, I hasten to add. Some of them we did work for, but others are, are just very kind. But the recent award that we did get, which is the Queen's Award, was uh, a tremendous achievement, an achievement for an anatomy department. And I am, if you were to cut me in half, and like a piece of rock, there would be the word anatomy running right the way up and down a vertebral column, because it is the core of what I do. And to me, it's also the core of the success of the medical school that we have. So there was no way I was going to Dundee if we didn't have an anatomy department. There was no way I was going to stay in an anatomy department that didn't dissect, and they had to dissect cadavers. And so I'll be there at Dundee for as long as we keep doing that. We've changed our cadavers, which is great. We've, even, we've developed a, a new form of soft fix, um, which is proving to be very challenging for our medical students, which is wonderful, because they might actually learn some anatomy. So we're going to talk about the history of forensic anthropology. Is it really forensic anthropology, or is it, in fact, something else? I have to put this up, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the history of the subject, but also going to intersperse it with some things that are more current. So there are some images in here that are not very comfortable, but I know as an audience this, I'm sure, will not phase you in the least, but health and safety require me to do this. The reason that these images are here are not in any way to, to form a, an entertainment. It's really about an education, and it's about showing why it applies. So there is nothing gratuitous in here. There is nothing that you probably haven't seen much worse on the 9 o'clock news but at the end of the day, just in case there are any sensitivities, um, it's certainly not my intention to offend. Everybody likes a definition. I happen to think, being an anatomist, that all medics are just applied anatomists anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Especially surgeons. Um, anatomy is at the core of what we do. And in terms of defining forensic anthropology... I happen to feel that anatomy is at the core of that. These subjects are so closely intertwined and interlinked. Almost to try and give them a definition is by itself causing an artificial boundary and an artificial barrier. But if you think of forensic anthropology, you might think of that dreadful television series, which I hated every single moment <laughs> of, may I say, and will never, ever do again, is that this might be one of the sort of classic definitions of what people think we do for a living. But the, the misconception is that everything is about bone because so much more of what we do today is about the living and about the flesh as much as it is about those individuals who are just at the skeletal level. So we may be involved in a case, for example, at Heathrow where somebody comes into Heathrow with false papers and when they're picked up with these false papers, their automatic stance will be, I'm 17. They might look like they're 104, but they will claim to be 17. And the reason they'll claim to be 17 is because of the international rights of the human child that says that if you claim to be a child, then you have the rights and the protections that are given to a child. And it then becomes the responsibility of the local authority or the court or whomsoever it may be to either confirm that the individual is a child or to confirm otherwise. And so we might become involved in age <coughs> estimation in the living, which is an incredibly inaccurate thing to do, but something that unfortunately the courts sometimes request us to have some involvement with. It may be that we have a mass fatality event and a recent mass fatality event, so we're not necessarily looking at skeletal remains. So our team were on standby for the Kenyan disaster uh, with the mall where we had the explosions and the fires. 
because part of our job being anatomists at the core is that we can identify fragments. They don't have to be bone. We're just as happy with muscle masses, fascial planes, neurovascular bundles, anything that requires a pattern that we can in fact place it within the human body. And a lot of the work that we also do within our department is about identifying the living from photographs. So we've been undertaking recently a, a method of identification largely associated with hand anatomy, um, which has been incredibly useful and helpful in the prosecution of individuals um, for child sexual abuses. So when an individual is abusing a child and they take a photograph of it, a part of their anatomy may appear within that photograph. And our job is to be able to say what is the likelihood, what is the probability that the hand that is included in this image belongs to the suspect. And at present, what we have are um, two life sentences and 92 years of incarceration that have resulted from the research that we've been doing. Um, what we also find is that in these cases, about 82% of the cases that come to us in that regard end up in a change of plea. And that's an incredibly powerful thing for the courts. It saves a tremendous amount of money, but also does as it means that the victim now no longer has to go into court and give evidence. So there's a huge social benefit to it as well. So I don't really want you, you know, lurking away in the misconception that all we're going to look at are some dry and dusty old bones. We actually like what hangs off the bones as well. So we might be happier, perhaps, with this form of a definition. But when you place other words in the definition, you end up having to define those other words as well. So that if forensic anthropology is the application of the science of physical anthropology, we have to start thinking about what is physical anthropology? Where, where is the core? Where is the history of the discipline? Because the history of the discipline will very much guide and lead where we currently sit within a society and within our own field. If you go back and you look at where the physical anthropologists really were working. We can go back as far in time as you like in terms of the definition of what is a physical anthropologist. We can make Galen into a physical anthropologist if we so choose because the definition is fundamentally so broad and it is about the study of the human and the way in which the human presents, not necessarily just physically, which is the physical side, but the other side of anthropology that might be cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology, religious anthropology, so many anthropologies you couldn't shake a stick at them. And it means that these boundaries do become just a little bit blurred. But we have an incredible pedigree when it comes to physical anthropology, this identification of the human, which is so very firmly embedded not surprisingly within the anatomy laboratories, because that's where we understand what the human looks like outside and inside, how it varies from one person to another. And if we understand how it varies from one person to another, what the incidence of those variations are, then we start to get to a point of a discrimination, a potential identification of an individual, and then a statistical probability. So it isn't a great leap, if you like, to go from the <coughs> early dissecting rooms into the sort of modern field of forensic anthropology. There is a very, very logical way in which it can progress. Certainly, when we look at where we have that crossover occurring into something that we would for the first time be happy to recognise as forensic anthropology. That says taking those variations, those things about the human that we know, and taking them into the courtroom relies us on, on us having good records, if you like, from the courtroom that says that somebody came in and talked about this thing. We didn't call it forensic anthropology at the time, but there was no doubt that probably the first really identifiable court case that used the experience and expertise of an anatomist in the courtroom for the purposes of identity occurred with a Harvard anatomist and it was occurring around the, the late 1800s. When forensic anthropology as a discipline came into the UK and by that I mean a discipline that was recognised because it was going on we were helping the police with their investigations, as they would say, but not being recognised as a named discipline. So when the first um, training course came into the UK 
in terms of forensic anthropology. Not surprisingly, it was in an anatomy department, an anatomy department associated with a medical school. But it's in a very much later time period, 1987, before we really have forensic anthropology in the UK starting to define itself as a discipline. So, you know, if we were to look at this in terms of the history of man, we're barely in the neonatal ward at this stage. It's very, very early stages within the UK. But unfortunately for us, it's something that, that has a high profile. And we're aware that when you have that profile, there is nowhere. I've been in the world in some very dangerous places. I've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there is nowhere in the world, world more hostile than a Scottish court, quite frankly. The Scottish courts are probably one of the most scary places for any form of an expert. Um, they will attempt in any way that they can to discredit you because that's what they believe their job is to do. And you will go into court with one side believing you are the world's leading expert in something and the other side's job is to prove that you are the world's biggest idiot. And you will come out of court either one or the other depending on who did the job well through the day and I have been both. So that at the, at the end of it, we have to get to a position where we have to protect ourselves within the courts to be able to show that we are credible expert witnesses. And for forensic anthropology in the UK, that happened this year. So that's how recent this is. So certification in the discipline of forensic anthropology is under the professional body of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and our association that we meet under is the British Association of Forensic, for Forensic Anthropology. So it is very new, but it has a tremendous history, and the history of it is some of what we're going to look at. This was the case that we talked about in Harvard. So it was the case of bringing together a dean of medicine, an anatomist, and various others as expert witnesses in terms of identification. The deceased is Mr. George Parkman. Mr. George Parkman is extremely wealthy. He's a miserable so-and-so. Nobody particularly likes him. He is uh, the classic Ebenezer Scrooge type that you would expect from Christmas Carol. He is a loner. He collects, he lends money and he collects the debts. Um, and he's, he's viewed as being rather a haughty and unapproachable individual. He loans some money to Dr. John Webster, and Dr. John Webster worked within the university in Harvard. And he owed a considerable amount of money for the time, because we are talking about the 1840s. He owed $400 to Mr. Parkman, which was a lot of money. He couldn't return the payment, and so he borrowed again. So it's back to sort of money lenders like we have of today. And he found that when he borrowed more money, of course, he couldn't pay that back, and so the debt escalated. And Mr. Parkman wanted to call in the debt. Mr. Parkman went missing. And Mr. Webster, at the time, was not really somebody who was considered to be a suspect. He was, after all, an academic, and academics are beyond reproach and beyond suspect for such things. But Ephraim Littlefield, who's this chap here, he was the janitor. And he was the janitor within the medical complex. And he had realised that Professor Webster, or Dr Webster as he was, um, was behaving rather oddly. He was coming into the laboratory late at night when nobody else was around, and he was convinced that something untoward was going on. This was a drawing that was done at the time in the court that is supposed to actually identify what the crime was that occurred. But Mr Webster's body was not found. But they knew that the furnace had been being used in the department. Things were being burnt. And certainly when they looked in the furnace, parts of remains were found. And in the vault underneath the anatomy department, the decomposing remains of an individual were found. Professor Oliver Wendell Holmes and Dr. Jeffries Wyman, Dr. Jeffries Wyman was the anthropologist and the anatomist, were brought in to look at these remains. And in looking at these remains, they determined that they were human. Mr. Webster was found guilty of the murder of George Parkman, and he was sentenced to death. And 
he did eventually admit to the crime and he said that things between them had got a little bit heated and he had hit Mr Parkman once across the head with a wooden stick, which is what we suspect is happening here. He fell, he hit his head off the apparatus within the laboratory and he didn't move. He then panicked, wasn't quite sure what to do, dragged the body down into the vault and started burning parts of it. So it's an early stage concealment of a death. Pretty similar to the one that we have here. Unexpected in terms of the way in which it came about. A lady in her very late 70s walked into the police station and said, look, if you go and dig under this patio, you'll find a body. Which really sort of galvanises the interest of most police officers. <laughs> and they asked what happened, Why do you, how do you know that there is a body under there, who is the body? And this lady used to look after the elderly woman in question. She said that uh, she came in to see her one day and the old lady was dead. She panicked, she didn't know what to do, so she buried her body under the patio. It sounds a bit suspect of itself. When we excavate the patio, there is indeed a skeleton underneath there, but there is no head associated with the skeleton. So the question is then asked of the, the uh, elderly lady. We do have the body, and we can identify who it is. And I should add at this point, the lady has been claiming the old lady's pension for the last 10 years or so. Um, where's the head? And she said, well, I couldn't quite bear to bury the head. So I cut her head off. And every time I moved house, I took her with me. So if you go to the shed at the bottom of my garden, you'll find a Marks and Spencer's carrier bag and her head is in it. And we do indeed did find that her head was in there. So that you will find remains in the most unexpected places. You cannot predict it. If you put it into a book, nobody would believe it. Because humans are very, very unusual creatures. And they do rather strange things when they're placed under pressure. Looking at, at bodies that, that decompose and that bodies that are dismembered and are scattered around for you to find, then we can go back to, to this case. And in um, March the 22nd, and this was two years ago, the first part of a body was found. And it was a, a left leg and a foot. And the assumption was that this had come from a hospital and that this was a clinical piece of waste. Somebody had had a limb amputated because it was so cleanly done. I would have hoped that a hospital in such circumstances would have missed a leg, um, but that was, what, that was the police thinking at the time. Until a few days later, a forearm was found, and then a few days later, in a different police force, a head was found. <coughs> So the head was found in Leicestershire and the remainder of the body parts were found in Hertfordshire. If you want to confuse the police, use different police forces because they don't talk to each other. Real problem in Scotland now because we've only got one force. So if you're going to dismember and disperse somebody, do it south of the border, as many police forces as you can because the chances are they won't talk to each other. So we have, um, we have the police force dealing with the head we have a second police force dealing with the rest of the body and somebody has to decide who has primacy. So we have two police forces discussing, I have the head and therefore, because we have the head, it should be our case because the head's the most important part of the body. And we have another force saying, yeah, but you've only got the head. That's only about 10% of a body. So we've got 90% of the rest of the body. I kid you not. They agree that they will in fact investigate this jointly. What is interesting about it, and I've, I've purposely not showed photographs of it because it is very distressing, is that when you look at the head, the head is obviously recent, but there is no face. There are no eyes, no tongue, no ears. The face has been removed. And all the deep tissue and all the deep muscle associated with the neck has been removed as well. But it's clearly fresh because we have blood, and we have a very pink brain inside and a very healthy looking spinal cord. But in the entirety of it, when you look at it, it looks as if it's a decomposed skull. 
The pathologist, bless the cotton socks, said this is animal activity. Now, I don't know what your experience is of animals, but whilst they might chew on remains, they're not really very good at removing eyes and removing tongues and removing ears, and especially not when we find cut marks on the skull, which is a clear indication of a sharp implement. And under those conditions, your average dog and cat hasn't quite developed the dexterity yet to be able to do that. So we were quite convinced that what we had was someone who had removed the face on purpose for uh, the purposes of uh, concealing identity. But what we had around the rest of the bodies was the most amazing skill in terms of dismemberment. If you try to take somebody's head off, it's very difficult to do because the cervical vertebrae overlap. So if you want to take the head off cleanly with a single blade, you would do it from the front. You'd remove the pharynx, you'd come down the intervertebral discs till you find the space, you can cut horizontally between them and then snap the neck. So with simply just one sharp blade, you can remove the head. That was what happened in this case. What also happened was that um, both hips had been disarticulated. So cuts through all the soft tissue, cuts through the acetabular labrum, remove the ligament of the head of the femur, and as you well know, out pops the two limbs. So both limbs were disjointed at the hip joints. Both wrists were one single cut through the radiocarpal joint. No messing about, not going too high, not going too low, knowing exactly where to find the joint space. And one elbow was also dismembered. The pathologist had said to be able to do this would probably take about 12 hours. Now, if you know what you're doing, you can do that within an hour and have plenty of time for a cup of tea. And so what we had was one elbow still intact. And I said, well, if the, if the coroner will give me permission, I will dismember at that elbow and you will have some idea of how long it takes. So I was given permission to, to dismember that at the elbow, which took about 12 seconds to do. And the marks that I left behind were very similar to what occurred on the other side. Of course, the question is, what were you doing on the 22nd of March, <laughs> Professor Black? You know, thank you so much. So we're looking for somebody who has an inordinate amount of skill. So we might look at forensic anthropologists, we might look at anatomists, we might look at medics, we might look at surgeons, we might look at butchers, we might look at gamekeepers, all the kinds of people who might have the anatomical knowledge and skill to dismember. This is the deceased. So this is Geoffrey Howe. And Geoffrey Howe went missing. Um, and unfortunately, even after he went missing, things were still coming out of his bank accounts. What we had initially, because the, the head was not fleshed, was we were able to do a CT examination of the skull and we can superimpose both of them. So at a very early stage, before the DNA results were coming back, we were saying to the police, this actually looks as if it is, in fact, Geoffrey Howe. So it allows us to have a quick identification. What we concluded was that the cut marks were not about animal activity, and it's very difficult sometimes to get the police to, to take alternative advice when the advice is given by a forensic pathologist because forensic pathologists are God. It's only God that doesn't know that, he, that forensic pathologists share that same space. And it is really difficult, in police terms, for them to, to take somebody else's advice. If a pathologist says this is the case, it is sometimes very, very difficult to be able to persuade them otherwise. But with the cut marks, we were able to do that. Dismemberment was taken with an inordinate amount of skill. Probably two implements used, one slightly heavier than the other, but really just sharp kitchen knives was all that was done. The dismemberment took much less time than the 12 hours that was stated by the pathologist. Slightly different pattern to either side, but the question was about why the head was dealt with differently. And we found out in court that that was really about ensuring that the forensic evidence at the end of the day was confused. So it's somebody who had a little bit of forensic awareness as well. Stephen Marshall was found guilty of the murder of Geoffrey Howe and his accomplice was Sarah Bush who was a prostitute and his girlfriend and their whole purpose was that they murdered Geoffrey, they stabbed him twice in the back they dismembered him they spread his body around different parts of the county, his intention was to drive north with the head but he got bored by the time he got up to Leicester and decided that was close enough he would dump it there but all the way throughout the court case our evidence is that this is somebody who knows what they're doing 
and the defence stance is, my client is a bodybuilder, my client works as a doorman, he has no experience, he's never done medicine, he's never done anatomy, he's never worked in a butcher shop, my client does not have this level of experience. So hence why I say you can look like an expert and you can also look like an idiot. He was found guilty of the murder. He was given a life sentence of a minimum of 36 years. And it was only once he was, he was found guilty, he turned to his lawyer and he said, well, it's not as if it's the first time I've done it, is it? At which point his lawyer's jaw hit the table and said, what do you mean? And he had another job. And his job was as a cutter. And a cutter are people who are employed by the London drug gangs. So that when you are finished with someone and you murder them, you take them round the back door of the nightclub and the cutter does exactly what it says on the tin. They cut the body into pieces. And he had learnt his trade as a cutter for a London gang. So he had done several of these. What he wasn't was the other half of the partnership, which is called a dumper. So there's a cutter and a dumper. And he was not prepared to spend the money to give to someone else to go and dump the remains. If he had done, of course, we may never have found them. But because he wasn't a dumper, he put the body parts in places that were easily found by members of the public. The only parts we haven't found are the hands, and the hands, we believe, are buried in Epping Forest somewhere, so they could be anywhere, because that Epping Forest is known as the graveyard for the London drug gangs. So lots and lots of bodies buried around Epping Forest. So the evidence was suggesting to us all the time somebody with the level of skill, but at the end of the day... We didn't expect the answer that we got from him. Go back again to another case in history, because I want to be able to show that, that, that these sort of cases, you know, Mark Twain said history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it sure sing, sure hums a familiar tune. And if we go back to 1897 in Chicago, we have Adolf Lutgert, who is accused of murdering his wife Louise. And he owns a sausage factory. And you can just see, can't you, where, where the myths are going to arise. Well, he does indeed own a sausage factory. And in the vats associated with the sausage factory were found these fragments of bone. And these fragments of bone were identified by George Dorsey, who again, back to Harvard anthropologist, identified these as being metacarpals, this is being a fragment of humerus, this femur, these both being from rib, these phalanges, I'm kind of okay with that, and these being sesamoids, which from these drawings we, we just obviously couldn't do. And he'd identified where in the foot these were found, and these were found within the vat. So Albert was um, accused and charged of the murder of his wife. Of course, what they couldn't do was to prove at the time that in fact they were her feet, they might be human feet, but they couldn't prove they were her feet. And as a result, he was actually um, not found guilty in the first trial. They went through and they searched further and they found some rings, and some rings which in fact were hers. But what happened in the press at the time was that the anthropologist, the anatomist, was lampooned within the cartoons that what do these bony people know Clearly, absolutely nothing, and hence why we are sometimes experts and we are sometimes fools. I loved sh that's Professor Squamous, the famous osteology expert. Wonderful. The case came back to court, and it came back to court, and he was found guilty a second time, and he was he, on the second occasion, and he was uh, incarcerated for her murder. We have a very similar situation in Lancaster. A man is accused of murdering his mother-in-law. He states that his mother-in-law came on to him inappropriately and he was so repulsed by this that what he did was he pushed her away. And when he pushed her away, she fell back and hit her head on the coffee table and then she never moved. What he then said that he did was he transferred her into the town centre and he had a, some, some rather odd statement that, that what he'd actually done to explain her being missing was that he'd soaked her in, a, in a, a mix of caustic soda, bleach and vinegar 
and had said that her body just melted away and disappeared down the drain. Too many episodes of watching CSI. You know, you know as well as I do that if you put a body into bleach and vinegar and caustic soda, it doesn't melt away and it's not going to go down the drain. The complicating factor, of course, is the fact that he owns a kebab shop. And you cannot make this stuff up. We might have a sausage factory in the 1800s, but we have the kebab shop in the current day. There is no doubt that her body at some point or another was within the premises because her DNA is found, her blood is found, um, both on utensils and on surfaces within, within the, the kebab shop where she is noted not to have gone because she was the mother-in-law, so she didn't frequent it. He was convicted of her murder. It was a, a fairly sensational trial, as you can imagine, because you know you have to close down the kebab shop for obvious reasons. There is no evidence that she ever went into any of the products associated with the shop. No evidence at all. But, of course, it becomes the urban myth associated with it. He was given a life sentence. And his brother um, was also convicted of helping to dispose of her body. We've never found the body. So it's one of the rare cases where there is a conviction for murder um, in the absence of a body, and she has never been found. So history does mimic itself. Um, in 2004, Margaret Gardner was last seen alive in Helensborough. Her husband is John Gardner. John was in the Merchant Navy, and he decided that there were going to be many schemes at which he was going to become rich quickly. And his latest one was that he was going to build kitchens for a living. And Margaret said, no more, absolutely no more of this nonsense. We're not having any more bank loans. Margaret received a phone call at work to say... That, that form you signed in the bank this morning for the bank loan, we've got a problem with it. She said, you're darned right we have a problem with it because I wasn't in the bank this morning. And what had happened was that John had got someone to pose as Margaret to go into the bank and sign for a bank loan. Margaret went home absolutely furious, going to throw him out on his ear, and it was the last time that she was, last, she was seen alive. Margaret had a little habit. Every, every night, just about five to seven, she would phone her very elderly parents and see, did they see anyone that day? What they had for their lunch? Did they go out that day? Just before they watched Coronation Street or whatever it was, and she stopped doing that on the 4th of October and never contacted them again. The police went round to the house, and in the bathroom they found some blood around the base of the bath tap. They can type the blood, it is Margaret's. They stick an endoscope down the U-bend of the bath and there's a little piece of chipped tooth enamel. It doesn't mean Margaret's dead. She could have gone into the kitchen, she could have tripped on a bath mat, she could have clattered her chin off the bath, she could have chipped a tooth, a bit of blood, can't in any way suggest that this is anything untoward. And then what they did was they went into the kitchen and they swabbed around the door of the washing machine and they found blood, and it's Margaret's blood. And they looked in the filter of the washing machine and they found what they thought was a fragment of bone. Fortunately, they allowed us to look at the fragment of bone before it went for DNA testing. Because if it had gone for DNA testing, we would not have been able to identify what it was. Because that's how small it is. It's about four millimetres wide, it's about a centimetre long. We can identify what it is, because that's what anatomists do. We recognise fragments, just like Dorsey did in the sausage factory. We can identify fragments. That is so obvious what it is. And it's so obvious it can't even come from the right-hand side of the body. It has to come from the left. There is no doubt which part of the body this represents. And it's the greater wing of the sphenoid. So it's the left-hand side greater wing of the sphenoid. Margaret can't be alive. As you well know, if that bit of bone's missing, the blood supply that we've got heading underneath there, she is not a rat walking around Helensborough alive. When you go back to John now and say, no, 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 we don't like the stories you've been telling us that she's just gone away, he confesses that Margaret came home, gave him a huge amount of grief. Things between them got physical. He chased her, she ran away. She tripped on the top step in the kitchen, fell down some steps, her head hit the floor and just exploded. Too many episodes of CSI, your head just doesn't explode. He then said he panicked, didn't know what to do, picked up her body and put it in the bath. We can explain the blood in the bath. We can explain perhaps the chipped bit of enamel in the bath. 
And then he said he didn't know what to do, so he wrapped her body in plastic and he dropped her body in the River Leven. And Margaret's body has never been found, despite the divers going in. So this fragment is all we have. We know it's phenoid, but we need to prove it's Margaret's. So we have to lose that fragment of bone for DNA. We do the DNA analysis, and it is Margaret. Now, fortunately, John didn't know how to work the washing machine terribly well. Because if John had done the washing and put it on a hot cycle with a biological detergent, we'd never have got the DNA out of it, and he could have got off. But unfortunately, he didn't put detergent in, and he put it on a cold cycle, so we were able to get DNA. And the reason he did that was when he carried her in, he realised he had blood on the front of his jumper, so he took his jumper off and he washed it. And obviously there was a fragment of Margaret's skull still attached. He was found guilty um, of manslaughter, but not of murder. And the defence lawyer on the case was Donald Finlay. I love Donald Finlay because he is such a challenge in court. And, you know, he stands up with his great grandstanding. goes, now, Professor, I'm not doubting you for a moment, which means you know that there's grief coming. And he leant underneath and he brought out the latest edition of Grey's Anatomy. And he said, you'll know this better than I do. I haven't read the recent edition of Grey's Anatomy. And that man spent two hours cross-examining me on the ossification of the sphenoid bone, on the growth of the sphenoid bone, on the soft tissue anatomy of the sphenoid, on the fracturing patterns of the sphenoid. Be in no doubt, lawyers are incredibly clever, sneaky people. And the very fact that on the basis of that one fragment, he could talk for two hours and cross-examine for two hours was really quite astounding. Afterwards, because I've met him socially many times since, and afterwards I said, you know, that was really tough, Donald. He said, no, you were fun, he said, because some some experts are really easy to get. And you think, well, you know, I could do without that. Thank you so much indeed. John Gardner was found guilty of manslaughter. He was given six years in prison. He is out of prison. He has remarried. In the UK, one that you will know well, because it is in the archives associated with this grand institution. I wouldn't dream of even going through the information in there, because you will know it better than I do. And this was a a pivotal case in, in respect of the UK and in the involvement of anatomy in particular with the police. Isabella Ruxton and her maid went missing. Her husband, Dr Buck Ruxton, was accused of her murder. Body parts were found scattered around uh, the Moffat area in Scotland and in other parts of Scotland. And in terms of bringing them together, the question was, who may the individual be? There is an amazing amount of of information in terms of the records that are kept, and this is the face of Isabella Ruxton, and the superimposition that was done between her photographs and the skull and the ability to grade the photograph into the skull. We are no better at doing this now than fundamentally we were at that time. What a huge achievement, what a huge leap forward in terms of the interaction of anatomy and forensic investigation. And it was a variety of incidences, if you like, that allowed them to be able to piece the body parts back together again. And this is Buck Roxton's admission of having killed both his wife and her um, companion, even to the point of removing the fingertips to try and conceal identity. So many echoes of what goes on in the cases that we deal with today. And I find it rather inappropriate that, for example, the bath in which she was placed is still in existence and is used as a horse trough at the police headquarters and has a plaque associated with us. This bath was used by Buck Ruxton when he, when he mutilated the bodies of his wife and his maid. What are we, why do we think that's appropriate? I really don't understand in this day and age. But it was such an incredibly important case and really echoes very much in what we still are doing. The photographs that are here are photographs that exist within the press. This case has not gone to court and therefore there will be nothing coming out of me that is at odds with what is written in the press. A gentleman is out cycling in Kerstorfen Wood 
and when he is cycling in Christophan Wood, he comes across the remains of an individual in a surface shallow burial. The individual is decomposed, and the purpose that is requested of us is to reconstruct a face so that the face can be placed out to the public. The individual has some jewellery, and the jewellery is quite distinctive and is Irish in terms of its appearance. So we take the decomposing face, we reconstruct a face, and because what we think is an Irish connection, it's placed out in both Northern and Southern Ireland and comes back as an identification of as Phyllis Dunleavy. This comes to court in the next few weeks within Edinburgh. So that Buck Ruxton may have looked at um, trying to lose his wife, whoever is responsible for Phyllis's death may have tried to do the same, to dismember, to, in many ways, try to obscure the identity of the individual. And by following, anatomists following in exactly the same footsteps as was happening in Edinburgh at the time of Buck Ruxton's case, we have a similar solution so that we perhaps don't move forward quite as fast as we'd like. This gives you an idea, though, that whilst the top left might be why you think what you think forensic anthropology is about, we are very heavily involved in individuals and mass fatality events, individuals decomposing individuals who are involved in burns, so that our expertise is, is really becoming much more well-recognised within the pathology field, and the pathologists in Edinburgh are particularly kind in that regard because they recognise that there are skills that, that they don't have and they are particularly generous in terms of bringing in experts from elsewhere. So we do a lot of work with the pathologists in Edinburgh. But why anatomy? Why is anatomy at the core of this? If you look at many of the areas that we will look at for identification, we need to understand embryology. What does embryology have to do with this, these two photographs? We know that when you decompose, then what we have is an acid formation occurs between the epidermis and the dermis, and you get sloughing of the epidermis. If you slough off the epidermis, you're left with a dermal fingerprint, so that we know that we're not looking at an epidermal fingerprint, we're looking at a dermal fingerprint. We know why it's sloughed away. And we also know that if we have a burn victim, if we can remove that outer layer, if we can remove the epidermis, then we are more likely to find tattooing much clearer because we'll be down to the dermal layer. So by understanding how a body forms, you can also reverse engineer it and understand how the body decomposes. So embryology and the understanding of embryology forms a big part of what we do. Histology forms a big part of our understanding. So for example, the image on the right is a lymph node. And we will know by looking at that lymph node what are, what are the dark patterns within there. The dark patterns within there are tattoo inks. So that when you have a tattoo that's placed in the skin, the macromolecules, some of them break down, they're taken up in the lymphatic system, the lymph node sitting like a lovely little sink trap up the top in your armpits or in your groin, collect all these macromolecules of dye. So we can look at these macromolecules, we can identify what the colours may be, so we can't tell you what the tattoo looked like, but we can tell you that it's just a green or black coloured dye. Or we can tell you there's red coloration in there, or there's green coloration in there. And that may become useful, especially when people try to obscure identity. And tattoos are terribly <coughs> useful things for identification purposes. And comparative anatomy. We, we get probably three to 400 cases come in every year from the police forces to say, what is it? And usually it's because it's been found on the beach and it's a seal flipper, or it's in someone's you know, pet dog in the garden or cat in the garden or whatever it may be, but every now and again it isn't. And we have to be just as comfortable in looking at the anatomy of all animal groups as much as humans and being able to identify what that is. Which is? Where did you learn your anatomy? <laughs> A long time ago. There's no excuse. No excuse. Anatomy lives forever. What is that? It's nothing to do with the middle ear. It's nothing to do with a, a larynx. Skin. Is it? Skin. No. It's the left half neural arch of the third thoracic vertebrae of a human, of a human newborn baby.
And the reason we need to know which one it is, is you can see the cut marks where the knife has gone in to cut the baby into pieces. So we need to be able to identify every single fragment of the human and the non-human from the point at which it forms all the way through until it reaches the adult stage. So it's not a great big sexy bits of equipment. It's just old-fashioned pattern matching and knowledge. Our most experienced forensic anthropologist is Professor Louise Shore. And Louise is 80. And when we had the London bombing, she was the most important anthropologist that we had there because she recognises the pattern. She's seen it before. And that's what makes it terribly important. And understanding gross anatomy when we have body parts. The London bombing was... Uh, 56 dead, but 1,300 body parts. So the anatomist, the forensic anthropologist that is trained as an anatomist on triage will look at the parts that are coming in because of the neurovascular bundle position, because of the fascial planes, will say that's the top of a left thigh, that's the bottom of a right forearm, and we will be able to place that, and that starts the human jigsaw, if you like. So forensic anthropology, you cannot get away from it, is based within anatomy. And imaging, so much of what we do now in terms of both the living and the deceased requires us to be able to just be as, as comfortable with flat plate x-rays as we are with CTs and with MRIs and with ultrasound. All of these things come together in forensic anthropology, but they all come together within anatomy and they all come together within medicine as well. And at the end of the day, identification and forensic anthropology is about the human and we understand the human we've been studying the human for a very very long time and it's something that we are quite good at but at the core of identification does it matter whether it's anatomy or forensic anthropology or medicine no it doesn't it really doesn't but it matters that what we have are the core skills so for example when we were involved in a court case in an alleged child abuse, what the child had done, she was alleged that her biological father came into her room at night and interfered with her. And a very smart young girl, she put on her um, Skype camera. And the Skype camera, I don't know if you know, in darkness works in infrared. And in infrared, what it will do, using infrared, you can't see that there's light there, it picks up deoxygenated blood that sits in your veins. So in infrared light, your veins stand out like lovely big black tram lines. And we went to court because we matched the superficial vein patterns associated with the biological father with the perpetrator of the sexual abuse. This kind of evidence had never been given in court before. And the judge decided to throw everybody out of the courtroom because he had to decide on the admissibility. And he decided that this evidence was admissible because it was based on the anatomist's understanding of variation. If you're in any doubt, look at the back of your right hand, look at the back of your left hand, look at the back of inside of your right wrist and your left wrist. Your vein patterns are not identical between your right and your left side. Anatomists have known this since Vesalius and before. And so because anatomy was at the base of what we were doing, the judge allowed it to be admitted into court. The father was found not guilty, and we were very worried about that because our concern was that our evidence had, perhaps we'd not got it across very clearly. And so we asked our barrister to speak to the jury to find out if they had difficulty with the evidence. And the jury's response was, no, we had no difficulty with the scientific evidence. We absolutely understood that. The reason we found him not guilty was that we didn't think the children were suitably upset because they didn't cry enough. So at the end of the day, even though your science works, it doesn't always work in the courtroom. We get odd things, things that people turn in from the public that says we've got a key ring we think you should have a look at. Yeah, it's a human finger, but it's the guy's own finger. So he'd been in, a, in an accident, an industrial accident, his finger had been chopped off, he'd kept it, he'd boiled it down and he'd turned it into a key ring which he gave to his wife for Christmas. <laughs> Well, there is no crime here. There is a crime of distaste, I would, I would suggest, but not a crime. And I love this. The police ask us, can you identify this man from his hands? He's wearing gloves. So that, you know, while sometimes we can work miracles, I have to say there are other times when we really do struggle. But our favourite one, and it comes in at least once a year, in fact, this year it's come on three times, is when the police say, we found some bones in a graveyard. 
Nothing gets by them, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.